Now, I'm, I'm planning to introduce Stoic ethics not just on the basis of that skeptical account of it that we get in Cicero, but also on the fragments from Hellenistic philosophy of the Greek Hellenistic philosophers that you already read. And there, key piece of evidence on page 190 tells us that Stoic ethics can be introduced under these eight heads. And so we have another one of these kind of curriculum or syllabi of Stoic ethics. We have that for their physics, we have it for their logic, and so we have it for their ethics. And the topics, and this is the order that they ought to be studied in, impulse, good and bad, passions, virtue, the goal, primary value, actions, and ending with encouragements and discouragements. Now, what I actually want to do is, because I'm not a card-carrying Stoic, I'm a card-carrying Epicurean, so I can present Stoic ethics however I want, I'm going to start with the eighth part on encouragements and discouragements, because this will give you an idea of the radical aspects of Stoic uh, philosophy. Okay, and the first point, so for example, here's some radical, even paradoxical claims being made, being made by them. The first one is that virtue is sufficient for happiness. Okay, nothing else is relevant. Pleasure is irrelevant, wealth is irrelevant, beauty or ugliness is irrelevant, nothing matters but virtue. Nothing else either leads to or is constitutive of happiness besides virtue or excellence, arete. Furthermore, the virtues, if there really are several of them, form a unity, and you can't have one virtue without having all the others. So you can't, for example, be courageous but not wise, or be just but not self-controlled. You must be wise, courageous, just, and self-controlled if you have any virtue whatsoever. Ever. Otherwise, you are, you are purely vicious. You're an ignorant, cowardly, intemperate, immoderate, unfair person. Uh, furthermore, intelligence or knowledge is sufficient for virtue. If you have enough knowledge, then you are ipso facto uh, virtuous. And if you don't have enough knowledge, then you are, for that very reason, um, ignorant, foolish, vicious, etc. Virtue just is a certain kind of intellectual activity in their view. That is, it's knowledge of what to do and what not to do, and, and thus of what is good and what is bad. And one having knowledge of that necessarily acts in accordance with it, and so is virtuous. And the primary virtue that encompasses all the other ones is wisdom. So basically the only people that have any virtue are the wise, and anyone who is not wise doesn't have any virtue but is completely vicious. Now we can attach some names to these various theses and components of theory. So the idea that virtue is sufficient for happiness is a virtue theory of ethics. It means their entire account of ethics is based on virtue, not based on consequences or outcomes or conformity to rules or obligations or that sort of thing, but has to do with a state of character of people. Um, the idea that all the virtues um, form a unity, and you, if you have one, you have them all, and if you don't have any one, then you don't have any of them, we call the unity of virtues thesis. And the idea that what virtue is, is a certain kind of intellectual activity, and a specifically a kind of knowledge we call intellectualism. Okay, so the Stoics hold all of those views, and they seem very striking and counterintuitive and offensive and elitist and so forth, and so we've got to figure out why they hold these views. But before, let's even get some more crazy stuff that they say on board here. Okay, so those who are wise and so virtuous are invulnerable in their view to um, luck and chance. 
nothing that luck can do can affect the wise in any way whatsoever. So the wise cannot be affected by having bad health or losing all of their money or losing all of their friends even or their city to a tyranny or anything like that because none of that can affect whether they are wise or not, and thus whether they are virtuous or not, and thus whether they are happy and successful and prosperous or not. All of those things depend only on the condition of their own mind in being wise. And so, contrary to what Aristotle says in the opening of Nicomachean Ethics that we read, the Stoics hold that the wise person can be virtuous while, and thus happy while being tortured on the rack by a tyrant. Okay, and some Stoics say that they'll actually smile and be happy while that's happening, and others will say, well, they might groan and cry, but they're still happy and successful. Okay, so even whatever miserable circumstances that are outside of their control you can imagine imposing on them have no effect whatsoever on their success or happiness because that is entirely a matter of their own virtue and their virtue is a matter of a condition of their mind and whether they have wisdom. And furthermore, the wise person becomes like a god in this respect and rivals God for happiness. The happiest God is equivalent in their happiness to even the unfortunate but wise person who has to commit suicide because they have so many bodily diseases and impairments and poverty and so forth. That wise person is equivalent in happiness to the highest God enjoying whatever else could possibly happen because the wisdom is exactly the same and the wisdom is the sufficient condition for the virtue, which is the sufficient condition for the happiness. On the other hand, all those who are not wise, and therefore lack virtue, and therefore lack happiness, are all equally miserable. So, my example, anybody who's unfair towards their roommate is just as bad as Hitler, or the cruelest tyrant and worst dictator. It's all vice. If you look at the state of their character and the state of their mind, it's equally um, miserable. Okay, so all of those counterintuitive and almost ridiculous sounding paradoxical views, they in fact hold. Now, does anybody want to clarify any of those before we get into how they reach those conclusions? Okay. So let's talk first about the primary impulse, because that was also the starting point with Epicureanism, right? What is the primary impulse according to Epicureans? Pleasure. What? Pleasure. Pleasure, yes. And what does it mean to say that the primary impulse is for pleasure? That everything will naturally be attracted to pleasure and adverse to pain. Exactly. So and, and give me examples of everything. All animals and human beings. Yes, animals, human beings. So we can look at it, we can study infant psychology, we can study animal psychology, and we'll find in every case that their primary impulse is avoiding pain and getting pleasure, according to the Epicurean theory. The Stoics reject that theory and say that the primary impulse of every animal is actually for its own preservation and survival. And so animals are congenial to themselves, not alien, and this is why they repel that which is injurious and pursue that which is congenial to them. Not for the sake of pleasure, but for the sake of self-preservation and developing into the kind of thing that they actually are. And so the Stoics appeal to animal and child psychology to support their account of the impulse the primary impulse. So they say that it's clear all living things self seek self-preservation. They all have self-love, self-awareness, initially just of their body, but in the case of human beings, you have an awareness not just of your body, but of your cognitions, of your thoughts, of your feelings, and you have ownership of all of these. You think of them all as belonging to you, 
and you want to um, preserve these. And all animals have this kind of self-awareness in their view, and all know how to move their limbs in appropriate ways. Now, this is so even if they're not conscious of these states, as infants and animals are not, and it's only in the case of humans that this impulse can get corrupted and we can do self-destructive things or um, things that imperil our, uh, self, our, our survival or preservation as the kind of things we are. And they think it's just ridiculous to think that nature would ever create an animal that isn't, doesn't have as its basic basis self preservation, and doesn't furthermore have what it needs in order uh, to survive. And so they contradict the view that it's, that it's pleasure. They say that pleasure is just a byproduct that happens to accompany living things when they join what's congenial. So if I'm surviving, if I have bodily integrity, then I enjoy that. But that doesn't mean I'm that I want bodily integrity for the sake of pleasure. Um, like, it would be painful if I had my hand cut off, but it's not because it would be painful that I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen because I want to preserve all parts of my body in a functional working order, how they, how they are if they accord with nature, and if I have the capabilities that nature's given me. The fact that it would hurt is just a byproduct of the problem that, that it, would, it would create for me. Um, and they observe how children and animals will undergo pain in order to do things the right and proper way. So children struggle to walk and stand upright, and they actually fall and so forth while they're learning to do this. Even though it's painful, they do it because they're trying to preserve a natural condition of, of being a human. And they have this sort of instinct and impulse in order to be a bipedal, erect, uh, uh, kind of animal, and they will undergo lots of pain, including pain of instruction and so forth, in order to get that. Now, I've said a lot about the body, but once certain beings acquire a reason, and there's some arbitrary age where this happens, like 7 or 14 or something, then your primary impulse to preserve yourself becomes focused on your reason and not your body. You're still, you still want to preserve your body, especially to the extent that that helps you um, live in accordance with nature in other ways. But it's really your reason that you're concerned about preserving. And this is why things like dementia and so forth are so terrible, because the, the thought that you, would, you could lose the ability to reason, lose your memory, lose your ability to think, lose your ability to recognize your friends and family and so forth, suddenly you start identifying with that, those kind of powers, more and more, and you want to live in accordance with cultivating and maintaining those kind of powers become what's important to you. Um, and you will undergo pains in order to preserve that concept of self-identity and uh, self-preservation. Okay, so that is their account of the primary impulse and there is a big empirical debate, as it were, between the Stoics and Epicureans on how we should really interpret this behavior. Is the cause of it pursuit of pleasure, minimization of pain, or is it really trying to preserve bodily integrity and self-preservation? Uh, and, and you can develop different philosophies depending on which of those standpoints you have on that, those psychological issues. Okay, now the account of good and bad. Recall that for Aristotle, there's a whole range of things that contribute to happiness that we call good. Is a question first? Yeah, before, before going to that yeah. part, I want to say that uh, the Epicurean you know, is more accurate in regarding the, the impulse or, or drive of human being. Because I think that if, for example, the sexual uh, pleasure was not involved in the procreation, then the, the most probably even, you know, the uh, human species, you know, would not be so spread in this so large number. So I want to say that this, the preservation of the species... And everybody, everybody engages in sexual 
intercourse for the sake of pleasure, and that's the only way to explain why it happens. Well, right? the, 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 the offspring is the byproduct of the pleasure, but the first, the first drive is, is simply the, the pleasure. But there, on the side... Of well, the but a lot of people have sexual intercourse in order to create other humans. And the, and the pleasure is just kind of a nice side effect that comes along with that. I mean, this isn't how I think about sex, but lots of people do. Not a particularly enjoyable thing, but you want to you wanna preserve the species, you want to preserve another being like you, you want to live vicariously. Um, and so you produce children. I think the, the nature put the now. Now it, I think it's I think it's just false to say that people are doing that, or, or, or it begs the question to uh, to say they must all be doing that just for the sake of pleasure. Mm -hmm. In fact, it causes a lot of pain if you think about it. Right, crying babies, never sleeping, so forth. I mean, I look at my colleagues that have had children. What are you crazy? <laughs> um, okay, but no, this is naturally what we should do. This is in accordance with nature. And so we undergo these pains and these sacrifices and, and the, the pain of being kept awake all night and, and so on uh, because that's the natural right thing to do. Now, Epicureans will say, well, that's really the only, that's, that's, that's the only point. But that's, the Stoics won't agree with that and would not, would not cede that point to you. Okay? Um, and there are a lot of people, I think they're wrong, but that say that you should only have sex if it's for the sake of procreation. I mean, I don't even think that the, the Stoics can, to them, can be attributed that ridiculous position. But there are lots of people that hold such a position, and so those people definitely don't hold that, hey, if it feels good, do it. And if they really thought that the end of it was pleasure, then what would be the objection to premarital sex or contraception and things like that? Right? Those things all presuppose that pleasure is the point of it. Okay, but not everybody agrees with those things. Okay, so let's let's figure out what we mean by good and bad. Um, the most controversial part of their theory. Um, they don't accept that everything that Aristotle says is good, wealth, health, having a good fatherland, having a noble upbringing, all of that's a good as in addition to pleasure, bodily integrity, um, <clears throat> uh, having lots of experiences, um, and intellectual things in addition to that. No, not all of those things are good. Only a limited class of these are good. A good is defined as, in one sense, that from which something beneficial comes, another, that which is in accordance with the nature of a rational being. And the bad is the opposite of those, something out of accordance with that or from which something detrimental comes. And they make a distinction between what's valuable and what's good. Okay? So there's two kinds of valuable things. Things that are valuable in accordance with nature, that is, they are intrinsically valuable. They, they are good and only good and can only produce goods. And second, things are valuable which bring about what is in accordance with nature, or bring about what is intrinsically valuable, even if those things aren't intrinsically valuable. Okay, so... Um, money is not intrinsically valuable. In order for it to be valuable, I have to exchange it for something, like food. But food, even in itself, isn't intrinsically valuable. The pleasure I get from eating, you might say, is intrinsically valuable. Stoics won't agree with that, but suppose we agree that the pleasure that comes from relieving my hungry, hunger is valuable, then we can agree that food and money are only instrumentally valuable towards that end. They aren't goods in and of themselves. They're valuable towards getting a good thing. Now, in the Stoic view, even pleasure itself can, is not an intrinsic good. Sometimes it's a very bad thing. It can be good if it brings about something that's in accordance with nature, i.e. virtue, but it can also be bad. Now, their theory of indifference. Recall the view that only what is moral is good. All other things besides morality are indifferent and indistinguishable from one another. Only virtue and vice are distinguishable from each other in the strict sense. 
though there can be a ranking among these other things. Okay, so recall my examples of things that we're indifferent to because they cause no impulse whatsoever. Like whether you have an even or odd number of hairs on your head it makes no difference and causes no impulse. Or maybe you notice this. So if you have if you have a hand sitting on your lap, is your small little finger extended or is it bent? Right? Nobody knows because nobody cares. It's something that we're indifferent to because we just don't care, okay? How many of you noticed, I asked you to last time, whether when you got up from your seat, you started on your left or your right foot? I asked you to notice that. Does anybody, did anybody follow my, nobody ever does, but did anybody <laughs> happen to follow my instructions on that? Okay, no, and that's because there's, it doesn't cause any impulse. You can't see any way that it connects to anything that matters to you. Okay, but there's other things that we should also be indifferent to, but they do cause an impulse one way or another. Okay, group A, things like life, health, pleasure, beauty, strength, wealth, reputation, nobility of your birth. All of these things you might think, you might have noticed, like if I said, hey, how many of you come from noble parents, or how, how, how beautiful do you think you are? That you may have given some further thought to. Okay, now the Stoics are going to have a way of getting you to think of those as, as, being, as being indifferent to those. Those aren't good things or bad things. They're things you should be indifferent to. But there's another class of things that we're indifferent to, and they're basically the contrary of all the things in the first class. Death, disease, pain, ugliness, weakness, poverty, low reputation, low birth, and so on. Okay? So none of those things in A or B is good or bad at all. And you should be indifferent towards every one. They could be good. Health could be good. Like, if health enabled you to do something good for somebody else, like to benefit the poor, say, and so manifest, you know, generosity and justice, then your health would, in that case, be a good thing. But say that um, you were going to use it to um, uh, shoot pe innocent people at school, okay? Then it would be better if you didn't have health and you were, in fact, crippled and couldn't, couldn't move, couldn't operate a firearm. It would be good and better for you, not better in the general scheme of things, or better for the people that would be the victims. It would be better for you to not have health in that case. In fact, it would be better for you to have death in that case. Better for you. Okay? And similarly, we can run this argument with money. If the money helps you get an education or helps you help the poor or something, then it's a good thing. If it helps you buy weapons of mass destruction, then it's actually a bad thing for you. Okay? And so since every one of these things can produce something either good or bad, then they cannot fit the definition of what is good, which is something that always produces something good. So they can't be goods or bads. It depends on the situation. From the moral standpoint, they're indifferent. So I can't tell you whether it's good or bad for you to live, or to be in pleasure, or pain, or to be weak, or to be strong, or whatever, because I don't know anything about the state of your virtue. Right? Those things could be good, because they could be instruments if they are being used to create a wise, virtuous person. But if they're being used to support a, an ignorant, vicious, miserable person, then those things are bad. And their opposites would be valuable. Okay, so any questions about that doctrine? Now, okay, just one last thing about this. But we can say, though these are all indifference, we can recognize that we prefer A over B. Right? There is an impulse towards one and a repulsion away from the other. That doesn't make it good or make it bad, make the other set bad. But, but it's 
to have a descriptively adequate theory, we have to acknowledge that we, in general, prefer one set over the other. That doesn't, that doesn't matter morally, because what, whether it should be chosen or considered valuable will differ depending on the individual cases. But we have, we're not going to call these like Aristotle does goods, and we're not going to call these bads or evils. We're going to call them preferred and dispreferred indifference. All right, any questions about that? There will be questions about that later. Um, now, selection, okay? We, we want to engage in appropriate actions, and the initial appropriate action for us to engage in is to preserve oneself in one's natural constitution, because that's our primary impulse, so we choose lots of things in order to do that, but also to select what is in accordance with nature and to reject the opposite, what is not in accordance with nature or what is contrary to nature. And what we want to do is get into a condition where we can make this selection constantly. And in and, and, and every choice and every decision that comes before us, we choose the one that is in accordance with nature and we reject the opposite one. And when we start doing this, then we start valuing this ability to select the right things in accordance with nature. So choose wealth when that's good, choose poverty when that's good, choose power when that would be a good thing to have, choose lack of power when it's not, choose to have a job when that's good, choose unemployment when that's good, and the wise are those who can make those selections among the indifferent things, always in a way that is in accordance with nature, and thus is using them instrumentally towards goods, towards virtues. And that is why wise people are happy, because they don't get confused and make the wrong selection when they, when they should have not taken that job, you know, um, gas chamber operator or whatever, you know, yes, I needed a job and it was the only thing that paid, you should not have, you should not have taken it. The wise constantly make those decisions that seem obvious, oh, having a job is always a good thing. No, it's actually not. The wise person understands the difference between things that are actually good and these other things that are only instrumentally valuable for them. Okay, now, their doctrine of pathei, or pathe, okay? Affections, passions, or emotions. The relevant Greek term pathe literally means something like suffering or disease. And the, the English word pathology comes from this, okay? Pathology is a determination of what somebody is suffering from or what disease they're afflicted with. But this is the same word for things like affections, emotions, and passions. Okay, so it's quite, it's quite problematic that all of those terms. You might think emotions are really great things. Okay, Greeks are inclined, because of the term that they use for them, to think they're really bad things and really horrible things. Okay, now we might, have, we might think there are good emotions like love and so forth that we want to promote, and I'll say something about those in due course, but in general, Pathe are irrational movements of the mind or excessiveness of our <coughs> impulses. Okay, they're, they're where we're getting carried away from rational thought and from wise thought and being affected by things. Okay, so an emotion or an affection or a passion is not when you're acting and choosing and thinking about something, it's when you're being affected by something that's happened to you, okay? And so the Stoics want to minimize you suffering from these things that happen to you and make you so upset. And they have a system for doing this by identifying how each kind of emotion is actually the result of a cognition, of a thought that you're having. They realize that what upsets us is not the objects that are out there. It's not my mother that upsets me. It's the thoughts that I have about my mother 
that upset me, right? Or it's, it's, it's not the, the fact that I'm a poor philosophy professor and everybody's making more, all of, all of my childhood rivals are making so much more money than me. That's not the problem. It's my thinking about that, that I really wish I, was, I had more wealth or something and I'm really miserable that I don't. That's the problem. I'm suffering from my thoughts about it, not from the objects themselves. In fact, objects themselves can't, if you, if you take on the Stoic view, cannot affect you in any way. Okay, and so you can actually eliminate all forms of suffering due to emotions. So what we do is we classify all emotions or passions or affections according to four different species of them, and we explain how they are all false judgments or false cognitions about things. Yeah? Um, just a clarification. Uh, emotion does it seem as something that are individualistic, and then, because it's considered motion, it is motion or it, an interaction between something external and internal, or is it just seen as coming from... Well, there's, there's an external stimulus from it. So, for example, if I'm on a boat and I see a massive wave coming at it, it looks like it's going to overwhelm the ship, okay, then that is, that is a, uh, a stimulus to an emotion. But see, what I can do in that situation, it's actually my thoughts about it that will bother me. So if I have a thought, there is an enormous wave crashing over this ship that I'm standing on the deck of, and that's a really bad thing then I will become upset, and I will suffer from fear of that wave. But if I think, if I let the intervening thought be, yeah, there's a wave crashing over this, but that's not such a bad thing. All that could do is, you know, kill me, or destroy this <laughs> ship or something. But that's not a bad thing, because living is not necessarily a good thing. My virtue is a good thing. Thing, but this wave isn't going to affect whether I'm a virtuous, wise person or not. <laughs> so, so therefore, I remain calm and unaffected by that. And that's a better thing to do in that situation than to start worrying and crying about this big wave that's going to overwhelm the ship. <laughs> okay, and what I should rationally do is, okay, well, if there's some way of... Um, battening down the hatches and so forth to make it safer, and then if I determined that it would be good for this ship, because not every ship shouldn't make it to every harbor, that's all an instrumental thing about whether it would be good or not. If it's carrying relief supplies for innocent war victims, then it might be a good thing. If it's carrying arms to support both sides of a civil war, then it's a bad thing. But let's suppose it's a good, it's a good thing, and so I want it to happen then I will take rational actions in that situation to make that happen, not having become overwhelmed by an emotion of fear. All right, and we can, and so we can explain how every single emotion is a result of a false judgment, and we can do this according to a grid. It's a false judgment that something either good or bad is either present or absent. So if I have a false judgment that something is present to me, and I think it's good, then this, they say, is the emotion of pleasure. And that's a false judgment. So I think that, um, that I'm a really good-looking person, I think that's really good and that matters, then I might take pleasure in thinking that. That's all, of course, totally confused. Being good-looking is not a good thing. At best, it's a preferred indifferent thing. But I could suffer from this emotion of pleasure if I had that false cognition. Or that something um, is absent that's good. Like it would be really good if I had a lot more money, and I don't, and so I desire to have more money. That's all confused, because of course money isn't a good thing. It could be just as easily be a bad thing. But if I was confused about that, like almost everyone you know is confused about that, then they will suffer from a desire, they will suffer from an emotion of desire. And they'll have these kind of ambitions and so forth related to that that's all very unhealthy things for them to experience. And distress or pain, the thinking there's something bad present to me, my poverty or my ugliness or my, my ill 
uh, upbringing or the state of my country that I'm living in right now. Okay, I might think that's all really bad and is bad for me, and all of those false judgments about those based on that false value system will cause me to suffer this emotion of distress. And fear, I've already been through an example with that, thinking that something bad is going to happen. It's not currently happening, but it's going to happen later. Okay? And then we can go through every single one of these emotions, and then there are a range, maybe an infinite number of sub-emotions related to each of those which we can define. So, for example, if we, um, if we define a desire as irrational striving, we can distinguish that, all kinds of species of that. Want, sexual love, hatred, quarrelsomeness, anger, and so on, can be defined as kinds of desire. Anger, for example, is a burning desire for revenge on one who seems to have done an injustice. Okay? Um, and it has to do with me making a false judgment that somebody's wronged me and I don't yet have revenge on them. So I have this burning desire to have it, and that's called anger. I want to inflict pain for pain. Now that's something I'm suffering from. Anger is a painful emotion that we should, that we should in their view, totally eliminate. And so it's interesting how you would define, for example, anger as a kind of desire or dread or shame as a kind of fear, okay? And we can, we can identify all the forms of suffering that are caused by these emotions and pathologies, and we can furthermore come up with a way to eliminate them by removing the false judgments that intervene between objects themselves and the subject who suffers from them. In between that is the sort of screen of thoughts about those things. And so if we can alter the thoughts that one has about those things, that is, alter the whole system of value judgments, then we can eliminate every one of those forms of suffering. Okay? And now I won't spend any time on it right now, but they do recognize some good emotional states. Okay? So there is, if, if I have something present to me, and I think it's good, and it actually is good, then that will cause a state called joy. So, for example, if I think that I have the virtue of courage, and I think that's good, and it is good, then I will experience joy from that. And that's a good thing. Okay, that's, a good, that, 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 that's a necessary outcome of making that correct value judgment. Okay, or if it's true that... Um, there's some good that's absent to me. I'm not yet a wise person, but it would be good if I were a wise person. Then there is a rational state there called wishing or wanting or something that is legitimate to feel and that one should feel. In fact, there's something wrong with you if you don't, if you don't um, feel that. Okay? Now, the... So we can go into detail on all of these. But what I actually want to do, and, and I've given you details on the handout, so one side of that handout is a synopsis of their entire theory of emotions, all the bad ones, and all the species of them, with all of their definitions, and then also with the corresponding good emotional states. So that, that one folio gives you the, a synopsis of their entire theory of emotion there. Now, what I want to talk about for the last couple of minutes is the other side of that, which gives a synopsis of their theory of virtue. Okay? Virtues are the essence of their moral theory. They are always good. So wisdom always produces good outcomes, never bad ones. You always want somebody to be wise. You never think it would be better if, they, if that person was less wise. Damn, if only they were less foolish, the world, or if they were more foolish, the world would be a better place. A thought never had by a rational person. Um, and uh, 
they also recognize four kinds of virtues. Intelligence, justice, courage, and self-control. Each of these virtues has a specific object, so intelligence allows us to make the appropriate acts, justice, the appropriate distributions, courage, standing firm in the appropriate situations, and self-control, dealing with your impulses correctly. And as with the emotions, there are several species of each of these virtues. So, for example, intelligence, there's deliberative excellence, there's good calculation, quick-wittedness, discretion, and so on. For courage, there's endurance, confidence, high-mindedness, cheerfulness, etc. And each of these has a corresponding vice, so intelligence and unintelligence, justice and injustice, courage and cowardice, self-control and wantonness, or lack of self-control. And each of these virtues, as I said at the outset, is a kind of knowledge and can be defined as a kind of knowledge. So, in general, intelligence, which is like the master virtue, since they have an intellectualist theory of virtue, is knowledge of what one is to do and not to do, and what it doesn't matter if you do or don't do. Um, and imprudence is the opposite, ignorance of what is good and what is bad and what is indifferent. Justice, knowledge of the distribution of the proper value to each person, giving each person what they deserve. Injustice, ignorance of what each person deserves and, and how, what they, how it should be distributed. Courage, knowledge of what is truly terrible and what is not terrible and what is indifferent. Cowardice, ignorance of the very same thing. And each subspecies will be defined a